Hi to everyone and welcome to the Chicago Pneumatech and Pneumatic Corporation webinar. Right now I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Ben Smith. Ben is the current product marketing manager for Pneumatech and Chicago Pneumatic. Ben has four years of experience working in the compressed air industry. He has specialized in the air treatment side of the business and has established himself as an expert in the field. So Ben, welcome to today's event. And with that, I think I'll pass things along to you to get everything started. So Ben, go right ahead. Hello everyone, and thank you for attending this presentation. Today we're gonna to talk a little bit about compressed air treatment. And uh, my name is Ben Smith. I'm the product marketing manager for Chicago Pneumatic and Pneumatech. Um, you could, if you have any questions for us, you can reach us at uso.sales at pneumatech.com. Call us at 800-336-2285 or visit us at pneumatech.com. So while today we'll be focusing on Pneumatech, I would like to bring up that we are two brands. We're Chicago Pneumatic and Pneumatech. Uh, with Chicago Pneumatic, we are that is our compressed air uh, generation side. Uh, so we make anything from small uh, piston compressors, rotary screws, scrolls, uh, water-injected screws, uh, and duplex piston units as well. On the Pneumatech side, uh, that's our air treatment and gas generation side. We make nitrogen generators, oxygen generators, desiccant dryers, uh, carbon towers, uh, compressed air filtration, as well as refrigerated air dryers, water chillers, and after coolers. A little bit about Pneumatech. It was founded in 1966 in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, right now we have manufacturing taking place in Houston, Italy, the Netherlands, and Belgium. We have warehouses in the US, Mexico, and Canada. We're ASME certified and manufacturing at all of our facilities. In addition to our standard units, we also do custom design work uh, as well as landfill gas and natural gas dryers. We can do low pressure applications as well as high pressure applications. We can do 50 and 60 hertz designs, which brings me to my final point that Pneumatech equipment is installed all over the world, which I really think speaks to the quality of the products that we create. So first we're going to look at why is air treatment required? Why do I need to install this piece of equipment? Or if I'm you know, updating my system, why do I need to put in some filtration or an air dryer or things like that? Why do I need it? And what are the different types of contaminants that are in this airstream? Uh, so we'll look at several different ones of those and how we remove those types of contaminants. We'll also look at the ISO classification, which is a classification of the different types of contaminants and their respective levels within that airstream. We'll look at the different types of air dryers. Uh, we'll look at We'll get more in depth into desiccant dryer technologies and why different types of desiccant dryer technologies are better for different applications. And we'll also ask a few questions at the end uh, to help you understand what type of dryer would be correct for me. All right, so I think uh, to get started, it would be best we uh, watch a little video here. It gets a good overview of uh, compressed air and why it's important in industry. Twenty one percent oxygen, seventy eight percent nitrogen, one percent gases such as argon and carbon dioxide, and minute amounts of trace gases. Together, they form air. Because of their low density, gases such as air can be compressed unlike liquids. Compression forces the air molecules closer together, increasing the density. Air pressure can be expressed in pounds per square inch, or PSI. The first way to compress air is by displacement. This means enclosing an amount of air and reducing its volume, like in a bicycle pump or a piston compressor. The air volume can be reduced in other ways as well, by rotating screws, gradually decreasing the space between them, or by tooth-type screws or scrolls. The second way to compress air is dynamic compression. Air is drawn into a rapidly rotating impeller and accelerates. The kinetic energy is then transformed into pressure as the air slows down by expansion. Compressed air is a useful resource in virtually every manufacturing process. It can produce motion and exert force, such as in pneumatically powered tools or machines. We then call it energy air. It's a main power source on many construction sites. 
as well as in remote locations, such as drill rigs or on ships. It powers braking systems and opens train doors. When air is part of a production process, we refer to it as active air. It conveys tons of powders, pellets, and grains. It's used to maintain pipelines and provides the pressure for cleaning and paint spraying. Overpressure keeps out impurities from clean rooms and critical production areas. Compressed air is also a vital component in fermentation, combustion, liquefaction, and refrigeration. It's used for gas treatment or air separation. Because the gases forming air are not mixed chemically, they can be separated into oxygen, nitrogen, and argon. Compressed air also provides oxygen to water purification and blows plastics into shape. It helps patients breathe and drives precision tools in a medical environment. In short, compressed air plays a part in countless products and services we enjoy every day. Air has a capacity to convey objects. It also conveys very small components such as solid particles, microorganisms, and water vapor. As air is compressed, the relative particle content and humidity increases dramatically, causing water vapor to condensate, potentially leading to contamination of equipment or products. That's why sophisticated equipment accompanies the compressor itself, filtering impurities draining the water condensate, ensuring clean, dry air of the highest quality. An American-born global leader in delivering high-quality air solutions since 1966 is Pneumatech. So we're going to look at some of the effects of compression and why we have these contaminants in our air. So if you imagine a large box, let's say it's a box the size of a room, and you take that box and you shrink it down in size uh, to the size of a, you know, a small package, you've got the same amount of dust and contaminants and oil aerosols and moisture, but instead now that's w much more concentrated in that smaller box. Uh, so that's why we have a lot of the effects that we do uh, from contaminants in our airstream. So the different types of contaminants that we have in the air around us, uh, we have moisture uh, in, the term, in the form of relative humidity. We have particles, we have oil, we have hydrocarbons, viruses, and even bacteria. So the first contaminant that we're going to look at is oil, and it's introduced uh, basically two ways. So liquid oil and oil aerosols, that's typically going to be the lubricant inside the compressor that you're using. So if you have an oil-injected rotary screw or an uh, oil-flooded uh, piston, uh, oil-lubricated piston, uh, that's going to have uh, oil that travels downstream naturally from the process. Now, of course, we're, you try to capture as much of that oil as possible, but most compressors have around a three parts per million carryover into the air system. Now, when we talk about oil vapor, oil vapor is due to contaminated air, uh, so hydrocarbons in the air. Um, sometimes you'll see if uh, you've got an engine running nearby, it can be sucking in some of those hydrocarbons coming off the exhaust of that engine, and that goes into the, uh, to the air system as well. Liquid oil and aerosols are removed using coalescing filters, and oil vapor can be remo removed using adsorbing filters or carbon towers. Now, uh, an adsorbing filter is a filter that you're typically used to seeing with an, an element inside, and that element is impregnated with activated carbon. Carbon towers have activated carbon in a vessel that the air runs through, and as the air goes through, it captures that oil vapor and removes it from the airstream. Uh, the next one we'll look at is uh, our particulate viruses and bacteria. Now, these all kind of fall into the same category because they're really they're all particulate. They're all pieces of something. And uh, this is introduced to the, air, to the air system from the intake of the compressor. Now, there's a, another way that it can be introduced, and that can come from scaling or rusting inside your compressed air system. Um, and what that'll cause is particles of rust to travel through your air system and end up at, at, the, end, at the end at your process or your piece of equipment. 
Now, we remove these using filtration, specifically particulate filters, and these are filters with very uh, t uh, tiny holes that allow air to flow through, but as the particles are either trapped or they stop and fall to the bottom of the filter. The next, uh, the next contaminant is water, and this is kind of what we're going to be focusing on for the remainder of the webinar. Um, as we compress the atmospheric air, and depending on the relative humidity, um, we're going to have a set level of moisture in that air. And so we squeeze it down. Now we've got the same amount of moisture, but in a much tighter package. So the heat of compression, when you compress that air, as it comes out of the compressor, immediately comes out of the compressor, uh, it's, a, it's in a vapor form because the temperature is very high. Uh, but after it leaves that compressor, it immediately begins to cool because the ambient air around it um, is, is cooler than the air uh, that's tr that has just left the compressor. So it immediately starts to cool. So as it cools, it acts just like the condensation on the outside of a cold soda can. Uh, that moisture, become, as, as it touches the outside of the can, it cools. As the temperature drops, that moisture begins to uh, coalesce out of the airstream. And so that's the liquid moisture. Um, there still will be water vapor, uh, but uh, we'll talk about that more in a little bit. First, we're going to um, focus in on the liquid water that occurs. Okay, so this here, this is a water vapor curve, and it shows the maximum water content in air dependent on the temperature of the air. So if, if we look along the x-axis there, we can see the, the temperature. And as we increase the temperature, and so this would be um, indicative of, you know, if we get up to the high end of the scale on 158 degrees Fahrenheit, 70 degrees C, um, you know, it's actually hotter, even hotter than that coming out of that compressor. So the air can hold a, 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 a large amount of water vapor at those temperatures. Um, so, but as we begin to cool, um, and we cross that saturation line, that's when cr condensation starts. So if you're to the, uh, to the right of the blue line, uh, you're gonna it'll be all water vapor. But as you cool and drop the temperature, the concentration stays the same, but then you start to get liquid water as soon as you cross that blue line. There's a term that you may have heard before. It gets thrown around a lot when we start talking about moisture in air systems, and that's dew point. Now, the dew point is the point at which you would need to cool the air in order for water molecules to start coalescing out of that air. Now, that goes back to our previous slide where we were looking at that saturation line. Uh, so basically, that line, anywhere along that line, would be the dew point. Uh, so if, for example, if the pressure dew point of an air system is 40 degrees Fahrenheit, then water will not coalesce until the air temperature falls to or below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so the reason I use 40 degrees Fahrenheit is because that's very typical of most refrigerated air dryers. And we'll get more into dew point. Um, and you'll hear it brought up more. And if you have any questions about it, we can answer those at the end of the presentation. Oh, the other th the other term is relative humidity, and I'm sure everybody's fami uh, familiar with this term. And it basically just means it's a ratio of the amount of water that's contained in the air at any given point divided by the amount, the maximum amount of water that that air could hold at that point. So when we talk about dew point, dew point always occurs at 100% relative humidity. So as soon as we get to 100% relative humidity, uh, it can no longer hold any water vapor, so it starts to coalesce into moisture or into liquid water. And so that's, that's, why, that's where relative humidity and pressure dew point are related. So here is an example of how relative humidity uh, can be affected by changes in temperature. Now, we're going to go back to our saturation curve. And that's the line in blue with that's the 100% relative humidity curve. And right now we're going to be at 77 degrees Fahrenheit, at 60 degrees relative humidity. Now, if we cool from 77 down to 59, what happens? So we go from a 60% saturated on this blue line 
where we're at 77 degrees. As we drop down to 59 degrees, we're now in the saturated right there near the blue line or a little bit over it, um, which means we're going to have condensation begin to happen. So we're going to have moisture start to come out of that air. So uh, dew point and relative humidity. So when when somebody's interested in dew point, they, they're really concerned with the water content what is the water content in that air? What is the water vapor in that air? Um, and that's more important to, their, to them than free, free water in the air system. So when they're talking about dew point, um, they're more concerned with the vapor in the air. Uh, so these are more uh, uh, applications which require much cleaner air. Relative humidity, when somebody needs, uh, when they're more concerned with relative humidity, that just means I don't want any moisture in my, any liquid water in my air. I don't want my pipes filling with water. I don't want to have freeze ups. I don't want to have, you know, uh, rusting occurring because I have liquid water running around in my air system. So as I mentioned before, the international standards or ISO standards uh, for different types of contaminants are listed into three categories. You have solids, and those are your particles, bacteria, viruses. You have water, uh, both liquid and vapor. And then we have oil, both liquid, aerosols, and vapors. So um, as you look at this table, um, the way that you would categorize air is the first thing you would do is you would go to your solids. Um, if you have a solid classification and the, the maximum particle size that you have is 0.1 micron, um, then you're a class one. If your filtration isn't quite that good and you've got a one micron part, particle size, then you've got class two. Five micron, then you're at class three. Uh, so as you, as you increase in class, you're basically degrading in quality. So class one is going to be the best that you can get. Now, the same thing is, is true of water. So class one is negative 94 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 70 degrees Celsius dew point. So that's, that's very, very, very dry air. That's, um, that's using a desiccant air dryer uh, with molecular sieve inside in order to get the dew point down to minus 100. Uh, class two is minus 40. And minus 40 degree dew point, that's going to be a, a standard desiccant dryer uh, with standard desiccant. Class 3 is a minus 4, and with minus 4, you can do a uh, desiccant dryer. Sometimes you can get it with a uh, um, membrane dryer as well. Uh, and class 4 is 37, that's going to be a refrigerated air dryer. Class 5, also a refrigerated air dryer, 45. And then class 6 is 50, and that's going to be. Uh, typically like a, uh, um, a, dr a dryer that is as a re refrigerated dryer, but running at a higher, uh, higher dew point. Uh, oil, we also have the oil concentration. And so uh, you have 0 0.008, and so that's going to be an adsorbing filter or a uh, carbon tower to get down to that level, uh, 0.08. Um, you're going to be looking at a uh, another uh, an adsorbing filter or a 0.01 micron coalescing filter. Uh, 0.83 is one micron, and then uh, then you have 4.2 and 21, and that's 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 high concentration of oil. So next we'll look at why is why is water and compressed air a problem and uh, the moisture carryover effects. You have rapid destruction of pi uh, uh, destructive pipe corrosion. Um, it increases your pressure drops because you have a rougher surface on the inside of the pipe, which um, uh, causes you to have a, a greater pressure drop. You have increased running costs through air leakage. So this is, this is a big one. Air leaks are a very big one in compressed air systems, and a lot of people don't realize how much money they're wasting while there's compressed air leaks. You have increased piping maintenance. Um, you get pipes that rust out or you get a big enough leak, you end up having to replace the piping might be up in the ceiling, so you you got a lift out there, or you got to hire a contractor to come in. You get water corrosion uh, entering expensive equipment. Um, so let's say you're running a bunch of impact wrenches out on the floor or something like that, or you've got a shop where you you've got a bunch of air lifts, and uh, that moisture getting inside those tools will cause them to degrade. Even if you're lubricating them properly, you know you run moisture through something long enough, it's it's going to wear out prematurely. 
Um, so the, the lifetime goes down. And then the, the performance of that piece of equipment uh, may, degra may degrade much faster or will degrade much faster uh, than if it's got properly dried air. And then dirt and contaminants mixing with products. So um, I'm sure, you know, product quality is important to everybody. Uh, it's important to me. So, you know, when you're, if you're using compressed air to make a product, if you're using contaminated compressed air, there's no way around it. It's getting in that product. So it's especially important, like say for food and beverage and pharmaceuticals, but even 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 so in in packaging and and uh, other consumer goods. I mean, you don't want to have contaminated materials in your uh, products. So how do we get rid of the liquid water? Let's get into more in detail into how we get the water out of our system. So the first the first method that you're going to see used is a called an after cooler and a moisture separator. Now these kind of both go hand in hand and that's why I've got them together on the same slide. What an after cooler does is it takes ambient air, it's basically like a radiator on your car. It takes ambient air and runs it through that radiator. And inside the radiator is the compressed air coming from the the compressor. And so that cools that hot compressed air down to around ambient temperature. So um, most of the time within 15 degrees of ambient temperature, 15 to 20 degrees of uh, ambient temperature. So that dramatic cooling, there's going to be a, that, that it actually removes a lot of water. An after cooler removes a lot of water uh, because you're going from anywhere from 350 degrees down to, you know, let's say 100 on an 80 degree day. So that uh, after that's cooled off, now we need to catch that liquid water. So what a moisture separator is, it's a mechanical means of separation. It basically uses baffles and directional flow and centrifugal force to separate the liquid water from the dry air or the air with water vapor still left in it. So um, all that liquid water gets trapped in that moisture separator and it goes out uh, through a drain in the moisture separator. Now, depending on the size of your air system, there may be uh, um, a lot of times you'll have those integrated into your compressor. Uh, so you'll see a lot of piston units sometimes come with a belt guard after cooler. Um, you'll see, uh, and, and they'll use actually the tank as the moisture separator, and they'll just put a drain on the bottom of the tank. Now, uh, rotary screw applications, um, you can get, uh, you'll see moisture separators on very large uh, rotary screws, um, and, and moisture separators and after coolers on those rotary screws. Air receivers. Air receivers, a lot of people don't think of them for moisture removal. A lot of times they just think of them for air storage. Uh, but moisture uh, air receivers do catch a lot of moisture now, especially if you've got one downstream of an after cooler and a moisture separator. Uh, so that air sits in there. It continues to cool because the after cooler can only get it to with a cer within a certain um, temperature of ambient. So it's still going to keep continue to cool off. Uh, so more moisture coalesces inside these air receivers, and it, it creates a storage. And typically, you have your inlet at the bottom of the receiver and your outlet at the top of the receiver. And that allows that moisture as it cools and it flows to the bottom. It doesn't get sucked up into the air system. So once you, uh, once you have equipped a drain to your air receiver, um, preferably a no-loss drain, so you don't lose any air along with the system, um, you, you have a very efficient way of trapping moisture. So if we look at a typical um, compressor installation without a dryer, okay? Uh, so down at the bottom right, um, you'll see this is a fairly large system, so around 2,000, uh, 2,225 CFM entering the system um, at a pressure of 102 PSI and inlet temperature around 95 degrees and ambient temperature around 77 degrees. So those are our reference conditions before we look at this system. So as the, as the air enters the compressor, the water is coming in at a rate of around 14 gallons per hour. So that's a lot of water that we need to get rid of. Now this particular unit, the uh, after cooler, 
is and moisture separator are integrated into the compressor. So that that after cooler and moisture separator is removing nine gallons of water an hour. Um, that's a lot of that's a lot of water. And then the air continues onto the receiver. The receiver in this instance is catching about 1.3 gallons per hour. And then then you have a coalescing filter after that that's catching about 0.3 gallons per hour. Now you may have heard me say before that oh, coalescing filters are for oil, they're not for water. Uh, they will catch some water as well. So the, but it's a, it's a small amount as you can see, 0.3 gallons per hour. So if we look at what's left over, we've got about three and a half gallons per hour getting pumped into our air system. And how many hours a year do you run? I mean, you know, if you're running 24 hours a year long, that's 8,760 uh, hours per year. I mean, and that's 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 a lot of that's a lot of moisture that's accumulated in that system over the course of that year. So you can imagine the damage that that can do. So how do we get rid of the rest of that water uh, that's left in your lines? So the first and simplest method is going to be a refrigerated air dryer, and it uses a refrigeration system just like you have at your house for your air conditioning to cool the air. But instead of cooling the air coming to your house, it's cooling the air going out to your factory. It cools that air down using a refrigeration system, as I said, down to around 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, as it cools, that moisture is going to start coalescing out of it like we talked about because we're dropping the temperature down. So all that moisture starts coalescing out of it. Well, once it's cooled down all the way to about 40 degrees, it goes through what a moisture separator um, that's inside the refrigerated air dryer, and that mechanically separates that, that liquid water that's coalesced out of there. Now, as it leaves the dryer, it gets rewarmed uh, by the incoming air. So you get the, the temperature coming back out of the dryer is going to be around 70 or 80 degrees uh, leaving the air dryer. And now we have a much lower relative humidity. We don't have to worry about if the temperature drops a little bit. Are we going to have more moisture in our lines? Um, as long as you're not in a really cold climate, um, it's a great dryer. Uh, as long as it doesn't get down below 40 degrees or get down below freezing, um, it's, a, it's a great and easy way to ensure that you don't have liquid water in your lines. Now, these can also be integrated into a compressor package, and there are three types of technologies. There's non-cycling, cycling, and variable speed, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but I'll, I'll, touch, I'll briefly say that non-cycling is a dryer that runs all the time. A cycling dryer can either, will either run or stop based on the load. So if, if it doesn't need to cool as much, it will stop. If it needs to cool more, it'll run more often. And a variable speed basically changes the speed of the refrigeration system to match the flow. Now, these are all different types of uh, energy-saving methods for, the, well, the cycling and the variable speed. They're just energy-saving methods to save you energy on, on your power bill. All right, now we're going to look at the operating principle behind a refrigerated air dryer. We're going to focus mainly just on the uh, on the heat exchanger or the portion that the air flows through. So as the air enters, uh, you have hot, warm, moisture-laden air, usually around 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the air goes into the inlet and then enters the air-to-air -air section of the heat exchanger. Now, this does a little bit of pre-cooling uh, to cool the air down before it enters the refrigeration system. As it enters the refrigeration to air heat exchanger, uh, it's going to cool the water down to around 40 degrees Fahrenheit. The air is then forced down into the moisture separator. And once again, the moisture separator is a mechanical means of separation. You're going to have liquid water spin out of the air and then exit through an electronic condensate drain. The air then goes back through the air-to-air heat, -air heat exchanger. That's going to warm the air back up, and then it exits into your plant at around 70 to 80 degrees uh, with a dew point of 40 degrees. So the second type of uh, water vapor removal is called a membrane dryer. Now, these are... These are good for lower flow applications, uh, hazardous conditions, places where you can't have any kind of electronics, that kind of place, or uh, locations without electricity, of course. And uh, they have a wide range of operating limits. They're quiet. Um, 
they do require purge air to function. Now, purge air is basically air that's scavenged off the clean air side of the, the exit of the dryer in order to basically clean off the membrane inside of the uh, inside of the unit. Now, uh, membrane dryers are based on dew point suppression, so they're they 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 don't go to a certain set dew point. Um, it's all based on inlet temperature and ambient conditions and pressure. Uh, so based on those three conditions, you can know, hey, this is what my dew point will be. But if you have varying conditions, um, you may have a wide range of dew points. Uh, to go a little bit more into dew point suppression, we, we have two different types of dew point suppression most of the time. You have a 32 and a 55. And pressure dew point suppression, PDPS, 32, means it will drop the dew point 32 degrees Celsius below the inlet air conditions at 100% relative humidity. So if you've got 100% relative humidity and your inlet condition is at 35 degrees Celsius, then it'll drop it from 35 to 32 degrees Celsius, which gives you a dew point of 3 degrees Celsius or 37 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's the equivalent of a refrigerated air dryer. Uh, the 55, of course, does the same thing, but instead of dropping it uh, 32 degrees Celsius, it'll drop it 55. So the same inlet conditions, we now have a minus 20 degrees Celsius uh, dew point. So as far as the, the operating principle behind these membrane dryers, uh, air enters the membranes um, and as they go through these membranes, these are hollow membrane fibers that allow moisture to escape. So as that moisture, moisture escapes through the membranes, um, but the air is allowed to continue. Now, the moisture is trapped kind of inside or between these membranes and the gaps between them. Uh, so what the purge air that we use is pumped back through. It's, so it's dry air that comes back through on the outside of those membranes and actually strips that moisture off and takes it out to atmosphere. All right, so now we get to desiccant air dryers, or also known as adsorption dryers. Um, they may maintain a stable dew point, so no dew point suppression on these. Um, you can have minus 4, minus 20, minus 40, or minus 100. Um, so these can be used in cold climates or applications to prevent water freezing in airlines. You've, uh, the reason we've got several different sizes is because sometimes, uh, especially for cold, if you're using it for cold climate applications, sometimes you're like, well, I, you know, I live in, I live in South Carolina, for instance, and I, I'm, I don't think I'll ever need anything below minus four, but it definitely gets below freezing here. So I've got some pipes that run outside. So let's just go with the minus four or somebody in a little colder climate may say, well, I may need it's minus 20. And it also depends on, on your, you know, your water content requirement. And that's why we say that um, these are also used in applications where moisture content is critical to equipment operation or product quality. Let's say, for instance, laser cutting. Uh, you don't want to have any moisture in that air. Uh, most models require purge air to operate, uh, and we'll talk about what that purge air is used for um, on these particular units. It's used a little differently than on the membrane units. And there are three main technologies. We have a heatless dryer, a heated dryer, and a heated blower purge dryer. And we'll look at all the different ones right now. But first, the operating principles of a desiccant dryer. So what... If you boil it down to the basic thing, like how is the moisture removed, the moisture removed is removed by a physical process called adsorption. And there are microscopic pores on these, uh, on these desiccant beads uh, that are able to latch on to those mo water molecules um, under pressure. So under pressure, it grabs hold of these water molecules and will, not, will, will basically start holding on to them until it can't hold on to any more. Um, so, just for instance here, one desiccant bead contains more pores than a soccer or field contains blades of grass. So that's a lot of pores. And each one of those pores is able to grab hold of a molecule of moisture. So first we're going to talk about heatless desiccant dryers. Now these are the, the, the cheapest option off the shelf if you're, if you're looking for a desiccant style air dryer. Um, they use air from the outlet of the dryer to purge and regenerate 
uh, one of the towers or multiple extrusions, whatever the case may be, and we'll talk about that a little more in a second. Um, they're the lowest initial cost, but they, they also have the highest operating cost. Now, that's due to that purge air because they need to use a good bit of purge air in order to dry the tower. Uh, so what you save in the short run, you'll end up spending in the long run. Uh, they have a three to ten minute cycle time. Now that means the time it takes to switch from one side to the other and then back. So that's, that would be what your cycle time is. How long does it take to complete a full cycle? They use 15 to 18 percent purge consumptions on the minus 40 degree versions. And if you have questions about purge consumption on some of the, uh, so the different pre um, different uh, dew point versions, we can talk about that later. Uh, the two main types are there's extruded aluminum, and those are the two that you see toward the bottom. Those are both extruded aluminum designs, and they use uh, aluminum extrusions instead of towers. And the twin tower design is basically just two uh, large pressure vessels that are filled with our desiccant, and they're used to dry and regenerate the uh, to dry the air. All right, now we're going to look at the operation principle of a heatless desk and air dryer. Now, this will be similar to our externally heated and our blower purge, but we'll talk more about the differences when we get to those two designs. So the air comes up through the inlet and is directed one of two ways. You have two valves, which are considered your inlet valves, which direct the air. In this particular instance, V1 is going to be closed and V2 will be open. Now, that directs the air to the right, and up through your adsorption tower. Now below the adsorption tower we have what's called a blow-off valve or a purge valve and that's seen right here as V10. Now that, that valve is closed on this side so it forces the air up through the adsorption tower. As it goes up through the adsorption tower the moisture-laden air passes through the desiccant beads and the desiccant beads start stripping a lot, stripping that moisture off of there. So once you reach the top you now have clean, dry air. It goes through a check valve and out to your process. Now if we look at the regeneration side, some of that air is being scavenged and that's going to be going from your outlet back through the regeneration tower. It goes through a scavenge line uh, which goes around V11, the check valve here on the outlet, and a small amount of air is metered out in order to go down through your regeneration bed. Now, like we talked about before, the lower pressure inside this regeneration bed allows you to strip the moisture off the beads and go into the airstream. So now you have some moisture-laden air. You have V9, which is the valve, the purge valve on the tower A. This valve will be open and it allows the purge air to travel out and into atmosphere. All right, in order to flip the vessels back and forth, we need to have a method to keep that desiccant nice and dry and ready for use. So the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to take valve number nine down here on the left on tower A, which is currently the regeneration vessel, and we're going to close that valve off, and that's going to allow tower A to repressurize. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to cut off the flow to vessel B. Uh, that's done using valve number two. And then once that happens, we can now open valve number one. This will direct the air to the left and up through tower A, which will now become the adsorption tower, and tower B will be the regeneration tower. Now, in order to make B the regeneration tower, we need to open valve number 10. That's the purge valve. That's going to dump the air from tower B and then allow all the moisture to start escaping from tower B, and it will become the regeneration vessel. Now, the next technology is externally heated desiccant dryers. They also make um, uh, internally heated desiccant dryers, but we're not going to talk, uh, touch on those today because most dryers uh, that you'll see in the market are uh, externally heated, and that just means the heater is outside of the desiccant bed. They use the exact same principle as a heatless dryer. So the process that we just looked at is exactly what you're going to see on a heated dryer. The added um, piece 
that you have is a heater. Uh, so that air that's being scavenged off the outlet is now going to be going through a heater, and that heats that air up and allows that air, just as we talked about with dew point and relative humidity, the higher the temperature, the more water moisture it can hold. So it can hold much more moisture, so it's much more efficient at drying that tower. So it does have a slightly higher initial cost because we're adding a heater to it, um, but it does have a lower life cycle cost because it's more efficient at drying the regeneration bed. It uses about 10% purge consumption uh, on the minus 40 degree um, versions. Uh, it has an eight-hour cycle time, so that's going to reduce your maintenance costs as well because the, the uh, valves are operating much less often than with a heatless dryer. And it's good for dirty or wet environments or where a blower purge dryer cannot operate, uh, so outside or in the rain or that kind of thing. Okay, so the last type of dryer that we're going to look at is a, is a blower purge style desiccant dryer. And it's very similar to the heated, externally heated desiccant dryer in the way that it works. But we, what we've done is we've added another component to it, which is this blower. So during that regeneration cycle that we looked at, instead of using um, the process air to regenerate the, the bed, what we do is we use ambient air through a blower that goes through your heater, heats that air up, and then that's what you use to regenerate your bed. Um, so it's much more efficient. It has only about a 2% purge consumption, and that 2% is for cooling. That's an average purge consumption. So uh, 2% um, is used to basically cool the bed back down um, from uh, after it's been heated up. So we do use a little bit of process air there, but it's a, a big savings um, because a blower is much more efficient. Now, we do have zero purge models available, and that drops that 2% down to zero. That means it uses no purge air from your process air uh, in order to rege regenerate the tower or operate the dryer. Now, they're not recommended for hazardous, dirty, or wet environments. Now, the reason for this is even if you put a filter on there, um, if you've got a bunch of chemicals in the room or it re gets really, really dirty, um, you'll either clog that blower up or you have a situation where that uh, blower is picking up all, that, all those contaminants and all those contaminants are then going right into your desiccant bed. Uh, so that's something that you don't want. Uh, it has an eight-hour cycle time. Uh, just like the the externally heated, which means you have less maintenance cost on your valves and things like that because they're not operating operating as often. So finally, uh, why is purge consumption important? Um, there's a lot of wording on this page, but uh, I'll try to cut through a lot of it. Basically, we have a situation where we have at standard temperature and pressure, and we're running at 120 psi uh, for our air system with a rotary, an average rotary screw compressor, let's just say we use about 17 kilowatts of electricity to create 100 CFM of compressed air. So if, if we have a process at this facility and it requires 2,000 CFM and we're using a heatless dryer, uh, and we need to size the, comp uh, size the dryer and compressor for around 2,500 CFM to compensate for purge loss and, uh, of a heatless dryer. So that's looking at about an 18% purge loss. Um, and, and based on the size of the dryer, that's where you get your purge consumption from. So if we take that 2,500, take 18% of that, so we'd have 450 CFM that would be required um, in order to purge the system, to purge the dryer. So that's an extra 76.5 kilowatts of electricity. And if, if this particular facility, if they run 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, and don't take any days off, um, with the average uh, dollar per kilowatt being at around 12 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, they'd pro pay approximately $80,000 per year for that particular type of purge rate. Um, but for the same process with a heated dryer, um, and this includes the energy required to run the heater, you're looking at around $55,000 per year. Uh, for a blower purge dryer, um, you're looking at even lower than that at around $27,000 per year. So you can see those numbers, it, it will really add up uh, in the long run um, if you're looking to save money on energy costs. When you're considering installing compressed air equipment for a new or existing system, 
there's a couple questions that you want to ask yourself. First, you want to say, what is my application? What do I need this air for? Is it for laser cutting? Uh, is it for, for blowing off something? Uh, is it for uh, plastics? any number of applications. And then what you want to do is you want to find out how clean do I need this air to be? Um, you know, what kind of ISO standard uh, does the manufacturer of this equipment recommend? Uh, or the governing body, what do they recommend? So you want to also look at your ambient conditions. Uh, so that means the temperature. So whether it's a really hot environment or a really cold environment. Also, if it's dusty or dirty, or if it's going to be rain, uh, if it's going to be outside, if it's going to get rained on, uh, does it have cover over it or not? Um, you also have some special, special considerations. Ventilation. Uh, ventilation is a big one that sometimes people don't think about because of the uh, some of the heat generated from compression and um, the heat that's rejected from, uh, from refrigerated air dryers and from uh, heated uh, desiccant dryers. Um, so you'll, you need good ventilation uh, in those types of rooms. You also have size restrictions. You would be surprised how much this happens, uh, but some people will buy a dryer and not be able to fit it in the door uh, and had never taken that into consideration. So we've ha had multiple situations where people actually had to dip disassemble the dryer, take it inside, and reassemble it. And sometimes as far as actually taking a, uh, a torch to it to cut it and then re-weld it back together. Noise levels. Um, uh, desiccant dryers, when they purge, they do make noise. Uh, so sometimes um, that, that's an issue. Uh, sometimes it can be a, a safety issue because it makes a loud noise at, at depressurization. Um, so you may want to take that into account. Also, electrical restrictions. You need to know what kind of electrical uh, capacity um, and voltage that you have at that location. And finally, is the initial investment more important than the long-term operating costs? And this is a big one. And sometimes, sometimes the initial investment you're just fixed. You got you got to go you got to go low, uh, so you go with the, the lowest bid. But uh, a lot of times, um, if you look into the future, you're going to see that savings, return on investments, a lot of times are you know two to three years, um, and even less a lot of the time, uh, depending on the type of application. So there's several things to uh, keep in mind. Finally, thank you everyone for, for attending this presentation. I think now we're going to go into our Q&A segment. All right, Ben, thank you for that presentation. Now let's take a look at some of our audience questions. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, just type it into the lower section of the Q&A window and click Submit. All right, starting out, what do I need to purchase to manage contaminants and the dew point in my compressed air network? Well, though, that really depends on the type of contaminants that you're interested in. When it comes to particulate, you're definitely going to be looking at some type of particulate filtration. Uh, for oil, you'll definitely need coalescing filters. And if you need a very, you know, if you need to drop the concentration in your airstream even lower than that, then you'll need to start looking at um, adsorbing filters or carbon towers. For water, um, you'll need to have some type of desiccant dryer or refrigerated dryer, depending on the level of moisture that you need. Okay. Next question. Do I need a dryer in my auto repair shop? Well, um, short answer is yes. Um, a lot of people, even in warmer climates, they don't have an issue with a lot of liquid water uh, in their airstream, but even that liquid vapor is caught, will cause issues. And say you have a cold day and you've got a dew point in your airstream, let's say of 80, 90 degrees, but you get a cold snap and it, it, the air temperature outside drops around, say, 50 or 60, you're going to have liquid water coalesce out of those lines. And all that, all that is going to go through your impact trenches, your sanders, um, that kind of thing, and that's going to reduce the, the performance and also the longevity of those pieces of equipment. So the answer is yes, I mean, even for a small auto repair shop. Uh, it's a good idea to have a at least a refrigerated air dryer. Thank you, Ben. I have a dryer already, but I am still experiencing a high volume of water in my air. How can I remedy this? Well, the first thing I would do is look at your air system uh, or have someone come in to take a look at your air system and determine if your air system is properly sized. Um, a lot of times we see instances where uh, a compressor and a dryer are 
you know, installed together, but it turns out that that compressor is capable of putting way more air out than what that dryer is capable of, of uh, processing. Now, the other thing that you'll see um, is high ambient conditions or site conditions that are out of whack with what our reference conditions should be. So ambient temperatures in excess of 100 degrees, especially in compressor rooms that don't have proper ventilation. Um, if you, you know, if you've looked at all those situations and you're still having problems, uh, it, you may need to look at purchasing a new dryer or uh, taking a look at your existing dryer and making sure that it's working properly. Okay. Next question. Is an after cooler required before my compressed air goes into an air dryer? Um, yes, typically you need an after cooler, but there are some situations, especially when you're using, let's say you've got an air dryer for a point of use application, what we really want to do, especially if it comes to refrigerated air dryers, is get the air temperature down uh, to 100 degrees or below. So you'll definitely need to have uh, a good bit of distance between your air compressor and your dryer uh, to get that air temperature down to around 100 degrees. Um, now, when it comes to desiccant air dryers, it's always recommended to have an aftercooler and a moisture separator because liquid water will damage the desiccant inside of a, um, a desiccant air dryer. It's also a good idea to have a mist eliminator, which is another form of liquid water removal uh, in front of that desiccant air dryer, and that's going to protect that air dryer uh, from having liquid water getting up inside of it and causing the desiccant to degrade prematurely. Okay, got another question here. What type of traps are recommended for water removal? Some use timer-based and some are condensate load. Okay, um, yeah, there's, there's actually several different types of, of traps or drains um, that you'll see. For smaller um, applications, a lot of times the smaller coalescing filters and smaller moisture separators, you'll see float-style drains. Now, the way a float-style drain works is as it starts to fill up inside uh, the, the filter housing, it reaches a set point, and that allows that to open slightly, and that lets some of that condensation escape. Uh, when it's a timer style drain, what you do is you set your interval and your um, basically your the, the length of time that you want the valve to open as well as how often you want that valve to open. Now the problem with this is that it's not set properly if it doesn't open long enough or frequently enough, you start to get moisture build up inside there and it will eventually carry over into your system. So what a lot of people do is they air on the side of caution and have it open more often than they need to. Well, the problem with that is that you're losing a lot of air uh, with that condensation. Now, the other form of drain that you have is what we call a no-loss drain. Uh, and the no-loss drain, the way those work is it, as the water or co uh, condensate starts to fill up inside the drain, it reaches a set point. At that set point, it opens a valve, allows the condensate to drain, but it closes it before it, all the condensate goes out and then you're just pushing air out. So that saves, that saves you a lot of energy over the course of a year using a float style drain. And those, each, type of those, each one of those types of drains can be connected to a filter or a moisture separator. Awesome, thank you. Let's take a look at one more question. How can I tell what dew point I need for my equipment? Uh, that's a good question. Um, typically, if you're if you're looking at a more sophisticated piece of equipment, let's say like a laser or a piece of lab equipment, the manufacturer will specify what kind of dew point you need for that piece of equipment. Um, now, when it comes to any other type of equipment, um, say, say let's where you're talking just your basic hand tools, most of the time we're going to require you know we recommend you do um, a forty at least a forty degree dew point depending on where you're located. Um, but typically, a 40-degree dew point is going to be good for most hand tools and things like that. Um, uh, once you, like as I said before, once you get into the more sophisticated pieces of equipment, it's best to ask the manufacturer of that piece of equipment what type of dew point they recommend. Well, thank you, Ben. Okay, we're going to wrap up the Q&A right there. We did not get to your question. Someone will be following up with you soon with an answer.
To learn more about air treatment and how desiccant air dryers can improve quality and production, please visit us at www.pneumatech.com. Once again, Ben Smith, thank you for your presentation and your time today. And thank you to all of our audience members for joining us, and have a great rest of your day.